Good evening, Junior Cook. It's good to have you out here in the mid-continent. I have memories of you coming in under the palm at 125th Street and 7th Avenue, and I can always remember Evelyn Robinson, Sugar Ray Robinson's sister, greeting you. <laughs> right. Hey, how are you? It's good, good to evening. see you. Good evening. It's nice to be back out here. And uh, I've been out and about, I guess, a little over 10 years, I guess. Uh, when was the last time, uh, and who were you with? Uh, last time I was here, it must have been, well, it had to, it had to be, you know, uh, maybe around 72 or something. And I was with uh, Freddie Hubbard at that time, if not a little before, because I think I left uh, his band in about uh, that year. <clears throat> well, you certainly have, uh, you know, those hash marks, those uh, <laughs> veteran uh, experiences with Freddie Hubbard, George Coleman, and Elvin Jones, and people like that. And... I'd like to go back to those, uh, there are always halcyon days. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking the days with Horace Silver and Alfred Lyon of Blue Note Records and those projects. Mm -hmm. Right. And also, too, with a remarkable recording engineer, Rudy Van Gelder. Yes, and uh, indeed he was. I was almost the beginning. Right before, well, that was, I guess, the beginning of my recording career, at least. But I had... Uh, a, little, a brief period that I played with my, with my all-time hero, the greatest, Dizzy Gillespie, right before that. And, you know, as we talk right now, Dizzy uh, has just uh, celebrated his 68th birthday. That's right. Yes, indeed. And he's still the king. <laughs> oh, he is that. <clears throat> well, your experiences with Dizzy, you were quite young. Indeed, yeah. I think. Uh, uh, what was your first impression when you were on stand in, in uh, his organization? Well, before I got on the stand... It was terror. <laughs> <laughs> Combination of terror and, uh, and, and uh, you know, unbelievable. How it came about at the time, um, this was when James Moody was uh, going into Overbrook, you remember? Yes. And, uh, he had been working with Dizzy, and uh, Sonny Stitt uh, did a brief period while he was in transition there, you know. And Sam Jones was working in the band, Jimmy Cobb at that time, playing drums in the uh, junior mass. So Sam being from Florida, you know, and... He knew me, and he was trying to, you know, help the younger guys along and stuff. So he literally took me out there, you know. I had uh, been, uh, I think I had met Horace, went to in Washington, D.C., I think, with a group called the Deltones, a vocal group, you know, kind of have rhythm and blues and doing some things for female singers and a male singer, you know, a trio and myself. And uh, we're doing like a, a theaters like the Howard Theater and stuff, you know, which is and the Apollo of the Apollo, you know. Yeah. And that's where I met Horace. He came up uh, at a club. He was working in uh, Wildwood, New Jersey, I think, and Lou Donaldson was playing in in, in Washington. And I went around to sit in sit in with the uh, Lou, and uh, that's where I met him. And he heard me and told me to call him, and he got to New York, and we missed each other <clears throat> a little bit. And then, uh, uh, like I say, uh, Sam took me out. I was playing a club called Connie's across from Smiles Paradise in New York. And uh, Sam Jones uh, you know, took me out to Dizzy's. And I said, well, okay, I'll meet you later. He said, no, we're going right now. I said, mm. So he had me. <laughs> no way you could escape. <laughs> so I got to rehearse, and when you play as Dizzy and James Moody and Sonny Stitt, I mean, uh, give me a break. <laughs> How old were you then? I I was 24. You know. <clears throat> oh, I can remember Snooky Young telling me about the first time he joined Jimmy Lunsford's band. Mm -hmm. Jimmy said to him, and this was in Washington, Snooky, you go out in front and listen to the band. And uh, at that time, Snooky listened to the band. He was so mm -hmm. nervous and terrorized that he said he went outside and literally uh, lost his dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that was the same kind of fright that grabbed you. Yeah, it was that. I just probably didn't have no dinner on at the time to, to lose. <clears throat> but I can tell you, I was never more uh, frightened. But one thing I always remember to this day, and uh, when I meet a younger musician, and I know how they can, how that uh, period, you know, can be, you know, kind of unnerving for them, you know. I remember he told me, you know, because I was playing soft and whispering and Fred and stuff, and, you know, and he said, hey, play it out, play it out loud, you know. You go make a mistake, you know, I'll make a big fat one, you know, that's that's cool. That's what rehearsal was for, and, you know, so what are you saying? You know, it's okay to make a mistake, you know, let's make it now. Let me hear it, and then we can correct it, you know, and that made me feel uh, somewhat more relaxed, you know, and he was great that way. 
So that's uh, a little thing I remember from all the way back there. And Dizzy. so I've been kind of after that. I think Dizzy went to uh, Europe with uh, one of those jazz and Philharmonic things, you know, they do with Norman Gratz and stuff. And I've been kind of jamming with Horace. I'd met Clifford Jordan. We came to, this was about 1958. And I came to uh, New York about the same time, and we were, you know, got to be friends. <clears throat> and he was working with Horace, and I think, and and uh, supped for him a couple of times, you know, because I was kind of familiar with Horace's music. And anyway, you know, one of my favorites and stuff. And uh, then I think my perfect changed bands. He went with uh, Max, and at this time, I think, you know, uh, some my influence was uh, he kind of heard a little Hank Mobley. Uh, influence in me, you know, who had been, they had worked with the jazz mission together, you know, and some of his early dates. So I think that's how uh, the gear came about. Well, that's certainly a fascinating story, Junior Cook, you joining Dizzy Gillespie and also branching off and going out with Horace Silver. I'm telling you, it's, it's unbelievable <laughs> for me, you know. It was a dream come true. And uh, that was, uh, and those days with the Horace, uh, were really exciting. Like I say, you know, we were very young, and I made my first trips to Europe with Horace, I think, in 1959, you know, Gene Taylor, uh, Louis Hayes, uh, Horace, and, uh, and uh, Blue Mitchell. Well, Before that, uh, Louis Smith worked with us briefly, the interpreter from, uh, originally from Memphis there. He's out in, he teaches out in Ann Arbor now, I think. I saw him uh, about a year or so ago. Still sounding good. And uh, and he's looking for Blue, I think, and, uh, and we hooked up, and Blue came up and joined us in uh, about May of 1958, I think. And uh, I made my first trip, like I said, to Europe, and that was very exciting and uh, great. And uh, uh, so, anything uh, else you want to... As, uh, as you look at your career, Junior, to this point, mm-hmm. here it is, October 26, 1985. Mm-hmm. Looking back uh, to uh, the uh, early 50s and late 40s and mm-hmm. covering this uh, span of the decades, mm-hmm. what, uh, as you look back, uh, is the most impressive uh, uh, memory that you might have of a learning experience? Well, um I guess since uh, the first uh, uh, at Nath, I, I must have been doing something right because it seemed like the bands that I was on they kept me for a long time, you know. And people don't keep you if you're not doing something right, I guess. You know, that is to say, uh, I was with Horace about you know, six years, you know, about six years or so. And so that was the first extended, you know, uh, uh, period of you know, music at that level. And, you know, Horace is a great composer. Pianos, you know, and he wrote such a wide variety of music, you know, great ballads, uh, you know, funky stuff and sophisticated swing things, you know, and so uh, that was really, uh, 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 you know, like I said, my first extensive uh, professional period of learning, you know, so after his yeah, the music was very challenging and difficult, you know, so you really, there's no way you could come out, not come out better, that's what I'm trying to say. Junior Cook, it's a pleasure to talk with you and get better acquainted. Thanks so very much for giving us your time and looking back to those halcyon days of Horace Silver, Alfred Lyon, Francis Wolfe, and and uh, Dizzy Gillespie. As uh, indeed, I'm still trying to, uh, well, you know, we are jazz messengers, and I'm still trying to carry on the message that, like they laid it down, the great Coleman Hawkins and Leslie Young and all those people, Ben Webster and... Uh, uh, James Moody, my favorite saxophonist, and he's still sounding great and even better than ever. And uh, Sonny Stead and all those guys, so I'm just trying to pass on a little of, uh, I hope, what they, what I learned from them, and, uh, and things that bring my little whatever I can lend to it. So I thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk with you and thinking about me. Sure. I May I uh, do one other segment with you? Uh-huh. And this would be just on your, uh, as a faculty member at Berkeley and teaching and coaching other young musicians. Oh, right. And then, uh, thanks so much for that very interesting background. Oh, so, so my pleasure. Really? Uh, what happened, uh, how that came about, I think after I left Horace about 1964, 
and then uh, Blue Mitchell and myself, uh, most of the guys uh, <coughs> uh, that was in the band, uh, uh, Walter Bishop, Ronnie Matthews, and uh, Chick Corea played with us uh, quite for, for probably most of the time at uh, a period in his career. I think he was just leaving uh, Mongo Santa Maria's band or something. And you'll find him on quite a few records we did uh, under Blue Mitchell's leadership uh, on Blue Dog there, too. Yes, memory right. memories of a great player, huh? Right, indeed, yeah. Let, let me, uh, I'll, I'll start this uh, again and uh, yeah. with, with a, a greeting to you, and, and we'll talk about those um, faculty days. Okay. All right. On the line, Junior Cook, tennis saxophonist. You, you come out of the life experience of playing on stand in concert settings and in clubs throughout the world, and you end up on the faculty of Berkeley in Boston. Right. It's strictly like most things, uh, or a lot of things in life, it comes by chance and, uh, you know, unexpected. I had, uh, like I said, you know, for 30 years I had been to uh, many times in Boston with Horace and Ben, and then, uh, like I said, after I left Horace, we blew Mitchell and myself, and we had the quintet together, Rod Brooks, Gene Taylor, and uh, several different piano pianists. And uh, and it so happens I met a young lady up there, and uh, after we had, uh, that band had broken up, I guess, 1967, 68, I went up there on a gig and met this young lady. And, uh, I, of course, I had met the guys over at Berkeley. I knew uh, Harry Pomeroy and Charlie Mariano and, uh, and uh, Jackie Byard and those guys. So I was hanging out up there, you know, and they said, listen, why don't you, you know, since you're not working and traveling steady now, why don't you, you know, come on over here and uh, just do some jazz workshops, and if you want to, you know, take some courses. And so, so since I wasn't working and traveling, it was, you know, I wanted to be around music and active in music, and that's how that came about. So I had a pretty free <clears throat> situation there where I, could, I took some arranging courses and, and composition and, and things like that. And at the same time, I had, like, uh, just conducting the jazz workshops, which was, you know, just uh, I would uh, have the students come in, and then if they wanted to try some of the compositions, they had, uh, you know, composed or written. And uh, and I just tried to help them over with hop, uh, you know, some of the hurdles of uh, when you're first starting, trying to put things together, you know, learn how to improvise and uh, stuff like that. So that's uh, how that came about. What were the rewards uh, and satisfactions? Uh, well, that's uh, what, the, what the reward was. I got, you know, I got to be around music and I could still play some. And then I learned that uh, I <clears throat> I learned that I could, uh, you know, how to try to, you know, all teaching, I guess, you self-learning and whatever. But it, it helps when somebody that has, you know, traveled that road a little bit can help, like I say, help you over those first hurdles, or, you know, and so, you know, I just say, you know, this is some things I've learned and tried, and, you know, this might help you and work on this. And, and, and you know, it was rewarding to me to find out because I was learning still myself also. And uh, and uh, it's good, it's a good feeling when you see that you've got to let a little light, uh, you know, give a, somebody a little more insight, you know, and they can say, oh, wow, this is just a, maybe a simple little thing can help them over, you know, along the way, and it's, you find out that you can, you know, get your message across and convey whatever it is you're trying to say, and that's a very good feeling, you know, and you can, you can see that, uh, you can see the improvement, you know, sometimes they're a little too close to it themselves, you know, they think, I'm not getting anywhere, and I'm, you know, but, uh, you know, you're encouraged them to keep trying, and, uh, you know, I can hear the improvement in you, and, like that, so that that was best reward for me. I felt good about just you know trying to help and pass on little things maybe I learned and a little tip here and there that you know some of the musicians that I've met and that passed on to me. Junior Cook, thank you so much for giving us some insight uh, there as a practicing member of the faculty of Berkeley College in Boston. That's right, and still a practicing member of the saxophone fraternity and the jazz world, I hope. And I'm still practicing, and I'm still uh, trying to improve and learn more 